In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you and thought, word, and deed, and have not kept your Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us, that we may continually be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is the great 
Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 16th Sunday after Trinity is from 1 Kings chapter 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance, and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms, and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 3. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We stand. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. 
And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, while the widow, her dead and then raised again son, and the crowd which glorified God as a result of seeing the events recorded in today's Holy Gospel, were certainly the recipients of the Lord's great compassion on the day those events took place, consider with me for a moment the fact that the account of the events wasn't actually written for those people. Just think about it. By the time St. Luke got around to putting together in an orderly way all the events he recorded in the Gospel, events which eyewitnesses handed over to him, and from which he put together this orderly account we know as the Gospel of St. Luke, approximately 25 years had passed. Which means that the words which you and I have heard today, which recorded these events, weren't written for the people who experienced the events. They were written for the church. That is, they were written for those who would gather together to hear the events that had taken place. And today, some 2,000 years later, you are those people. You are the church. You are those for whom the words of today's Holy Gospel were written so that, you, so that indeed you yourselves might be those who have certainty concerning the things being taught about Jesus which is why Luke tells us he wrote the Gospels. Go read the first chapter of Luke. God, the Holy Spirit, would have you be those who are comforted by what Jesus did for those you heard about in today's Holy Gospel. And what did he do? Well, to begin, as he approached the gate of the city, he saw a funeral procession. He saw the body of one who was the only son of his mother, who herself was a widow, being carried to its final resting place while quite a crowd was following along with her. Upon seeing that widow, who was now left without a husband and a son to care for her, which means in that time that she would be left without anyone to care for her, the Lord Jesus Christ had compassion on her. That's the first thing we see Jesus doing in this text from which the Holy Spirit desires to comfort you. Jesus has compassion upon a woman who is in need. Now, you've heard about this sort of divine Christ-like compassion before. It comes from that funny-sounding Greek word, splonknizomai, which literally means that he had this inner ache of the gut. This is the same word used when Matthew tells us that Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's the same word which describes Jesus in Matthew 14 when we hear him seeing a great crowd and then having compassion and healing all their sick. It's the same word which describes the compassion Jesus has on that great crowd of more than 5,000 men, women, and children for whom he brought down bread from heaven. And elsewhere, here in the Gospel of Luke, this is the word which describes the compassion of the Good Samaritan, which we heard just a few weeks ago, serves to reveal Jesus. Just as surely as the father in the prodigal son has his own compassion, as he sees his son far off in the distance and then runs to him and embraces him and kisses him. For in today's Holy Gospel, and indeed throughout the Gospels, Jesus is revealed as the Lord who has compassion upon those who are in need. And so already, 
even before we consider the way in which he acts as a result of that compassion, we who are gathered here today can begin to draw comfort from the Holy Gospel. He who has compassion for those in need is he who has compassion for you. I mean, aren't you kind of needy? Now, don't take that as an insult. I mean, maybe you don't need food or drink or house or home. Maybe those things are well provided for you. But it could be like the widow that you're grieving the loss of a loved one and need to be comforted with the hope of a sure and certain resurrection of the dead. And I know that is on our minds this morning as we recently have heard of the loss of a dear loved one. Or it could be that all of those cares and and worries of life of which Jesus spoke about in last week's Holy Gospel continue to cause you to be anxious despite his promise to provide. And so Jesus being revealed as the one who has compassion may indeed be the very thing you need to be reminded of. Or maybe you're looking forward to surgery or have a sister who has cancer, or a child awaiting test results, or even wonder how you'll be able to handle that touchy conversation that you know you 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 have to have with someone this upcoming week. Or maybe you're the father or mother with a prodigal son or daughter. Or feel like you're the one who's been straying like a sheep without a shepherd, or have felt so alone in whatever is giving you anguish as others have failed to respond with love and care. I'm not sure of each of your exact situation or what your specific need might be, although my list of prayers is growing by the day. But just as surely as Jesus saw that woman in need, Jesus sees you in your need, And this is the very same Jesus who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever the need might be, Jesus sees you needing it. And he is filled with compassion. Now, beyond him seeing you, just think about all the millions of people affected by Hurricane Florence this week or the soldiers in harm's way, or the many mothers who are with child, not only in our midst, but all across the world. The list of needs is unending. And your Lord Jesus sees them all. Even as he sits there at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he sits there as the one who is filled with compassion for you. For all of you, like that woman who have a need. Now, to the widow in the text, Jesus' compassion led him to act in such a way that he brought her dead son back to life. With a word, in an instant, Jesus treated death like it was only a nap. He spoke, and the son got right up. And though we know that as a result of Jesus' death and resurrection, we now have the hope of eternal life with Christ, we also know that we have not been given a promise that the compassionate Lord Jesus will always act in such a way that he will raise the dead or heal the sick on this side of the new creation. Likewise, Though some are spared the destruction of a hurricane, others are not. Sometimes cancer goes into remission, but sometimes it kills. But regardless of the trouble, and despite our endless list of needs, we we know for certain that the Lord Jesus sees everyone in their need, their individual need, and he has compassion. 
You see, where we don't have a promise to tell us how the Lord will act or what the tribulation will bring to us in the midst of that tribulation. And regardless of the depth of our need, even if we've brought that need upon ourselves because of our foolish choices, the Lord Jesus is filled with compassion for us. And that is a fact with which the Holy Spirit will comfort us. Now, we also must confess that we know that our tribulation may end up in the worst possible scenario. But even then, the compassion of our Lord Jesus is a source of great comfort. For it is this, this compassion of Jesus which did in fact lead him to act not only in raising the widow's son, but even more importantly, It was this compassion of Jesus that caused him to take on flesh, to come down to earth, to give his life, to shed his blood so that you could, so that he could die in your place and then be raised on the third day as the crucified but now risen only Son of the Father. Just think about that. The work that he did as a result of the compassion in our text, when he spoke to that widow's son, certainly did raise that son and provide provision to to his mother. But even greater than that, even greater than that, is the work he did as a result of his compassion when he endured the cross and scorned its shame and so then gave up his life into death so that later, having also been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the throne of God, he would be the one who would stand victorious over everything that could bring us trouble. For while the words that he spoke out of compassion for the widow in need gave life to the boy and provision to his mom, the body that he gave on the cross and the blood he shed from it now serve as a sign which is preached into our ears to give us faith and and hope and life forever. What he has done out of his great compassion is the work that makes us certain about what is being taught about Jesus. Jesus. In him, our greatest needs and our terrible tribulations are only but for a moment. Compared to the eternity he has promised to those who believe in him. You know, as a pastor, there have been hundreds, if not thousands of times, that I've been called to the bedside of a dear child of God suffering from some affliction. Congestive heart failure, cancer, an infection, knee replacement, a broken arm, whatever the case might be. In the midst of that trouble... We are bold to call upon the name of the Lord. As his own children, having been given his own name and trusting that he is our loving Heavenly Father who has proved his love for us by sending his own Son to die for us. We do well, like St. Paul said in, in the epistle, to bow down before the Father or to wear out our knees in prayer or to do like Elijah did for the widow's son, right? To call upon the name of the Lord in every trouble. And whether or not the doctors are confident in their prognosis, And whether or not that person in need is going to recover, there is indeed one thing of which we can be certain even in the midst of our terrible tribulation. It isn't that surgery is always successful. 
or that the cancer will go into remission or that person will recover. None of that is promised to us. But what is promised to us by God's own word and proven, proven for us by Jesus' own resurrection is that no matter what happens in this world, the Lord will raise up the faithful in the new creation. Think about that. Just as surely as Jesus himself was raised from the dead after suffering the worst kind of tribulation, all who believe in him themselves will be raised from the dead by his own word of command. He will speak And from death, we will awaken so wide awake and alive that our own death will be the one that has appeared to be only a nap. You see, the one who is compassionate and said to the son of that widow, young man, I say to you, arise, is he who is going to come in great glory and speak to you who have believed his word of promise so that you will be those who are raised to live with him unto life everlasting. Remember, dear friends, the events of the Holy Gospel are recorded so that you who are gathered here today as the church would be certain about what is being taught about Jesus. So that what is being taught about Jesus might bring you comfort and guidance even in the midst of your troubles and in the most serious kind of need. For Jesus sees you with that need and he has compassion. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all our understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We now confess the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. I eat in one God. If you uh, had your picture taken for the directory, those of you who ordered additional photos are having your complimentary 8x10 mailed to you with those additional photos. But if you were only supposed to get the complimentary 8x10, that was actually mailed to the church. And so those are available for you in the narthex. There's a stack of them. They're in alphabetical order. So if you're expecting to get just that complimentary 8x10, you can pick those up in the narthex after the service. 
I do have then two prayer requests. Charlie Cast is already included uh, in our list of those who are ill or suffering. Charlie is very weak and uh, is in need of your prayer. He has had fluid on the, hearts and, uh, on the heart and uh, can use any of your prayers. Also, we did learn very early this morning that our brother in Christ, Daryl Ehlers, suffered a heart attack overnight and is now resting at peace with Christ. So we pray for Marlene and the family. Arrangements are pending at this time, but we will announce those as they're made this week. We now gather our hearts in prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For all those who have been raised to new life through baptism into Christ, that they would be strengthened by the Spirit, rooted and grounded in love, know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and be filled with all the fullness of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world, and for an increase in faithful servants sent out into the harvest, that the proclamation of the gospel would resound in all places, Sinners of all nations would hear and believe, and Christ's kingdom would be expanded. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for all pastors, that they would be diligent in their study, compassionate and loving in their duties, and humble in their care, always recognizing that they are the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. over us, that they would serve with integrity and honor, seeking after peace and the common good of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who live in lands where persecution and poverty are severe, that they would put their trust in him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, and according to his will find refuge in other more hospitable places. J, Bonnie, Larry, David, Juanita, Charlie, Myra, Marlene, and all Daryl's family. That God would incline his ear to hear our prayers, heal and restore them according to his will, comfort them with his promises, and keep them in the faith that leads to eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the lives given to expectant mothers, that they be protected from all harm, without complication, and that their parents be faithful not only to bring them to the font to receive the healing of water and the word, but also to teach them all that Jesus has given us in the word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The service continues as we stand and sing together the offertory. <clears throat> what shall I render to the Lord? Thank you, gentlemen. For all his benefits to me. I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Sleeper, rise from. Her. 